Hello, everyone. I'm Philip Ross, partner and leader of Anshin's architecture and engineering and construction industry groups. I want to thank everybody for attending this event, even though it is virtual. At this time, I would like to introduce a second panel. Let's welcome David Pfeffer, partner and chair of the construction group with Tartar, Krinsky, and Drogan. David will moderate the second panel, which is on the future of office design post-pandemic workplace strategies. David? Good morning. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I think this panel will give us an opportunity to drill down on really what clients are looking for, office tenant clients in particular, with respect to their design and construction needs. So why don't I have each one of you um, kick it off with a brief introduction. Tom? Good morning, everyone. Tom Beckdown here. Uh, I'm the executive director of Vocon's New York office. We're a boutique architecture firm that's focused on um, building re commercial office building repositioning, workplace innovation, and real estate strategy. It's great to be here. Thank you, David. Linda, good morning. How about a brief introduction? Sure, good morning, all. Linda Foggy here. I am uh, the head of the New York office for Turner and Townsend, and we are a project management, cost management consulting uh, consultancy here in New York, and we uh, mostly focus on the real estate sector. We also do some work with renewables and natural resources, as well as infrastructure, uh, sort of the airports and railways, and I'm also uh, thrilled to be here with you all today. Mitchell, good morning. JBMB. Good morning, David, and good morning, all. Much simpler, partner, Jarris Ben and Bowles Consulting Engineers, and we are uh, a leading mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire protection engineering firm in the commercial, uh, institutional, and cultural space in New York and around the world. Jonathan Ratner, good morning. Hey, everyone, Jonathan Ratner. I'm at Madison Capital. Uh, we're an investor and operator of commercial real estate in major markets with approximately $3.1 billion portfolio, currently in New York, San Francisco, Chicago, and Miami. Tom, I want to kick it off with you. What we've been seeing in the legal field from March through the summer was renegotiations of um, tenant space, leases, lots and lots of buyouts. But since the fall, we've been seeing a lot more planning, um, a lot more questions about how we're going to get back how we're gonna deal with some employees in a remote situation. What are you seeing with respect to your clients' emerging priorities, Tom? Uh, well, you know, it's interesting, David. I, I sort of split it into two categories because I'm kind of at both ends of the supply chain. I focus with enterprise clients and executives who have workplaces and employees and then developers and building owners. And both sides are sort of looking at uh, igniting the conversation, building owners recognize there'll be a flight to quality, building owners recognize that the conversation with tenants has changed, that this idea of what they're offering is a platform, is more of a platform than just a commodity product and a container. And at the same time, the executives I'm working with in the in boutique finance and tech, who are starting to think about how to come back, they're looking at what is the new agenda for the workplace today? You know, How is my workplace going to bring back the people that need to be back? invite people back in a fresh, safe way. And then I like to say, uh, quoting a client of mine that I'm working with now, a media and tech and telecommunications executive is, how is the workplace a seamless dashboard for both hybrid work outside the office, but also inside the office? So some, those are some of the very high level themes, but people are really looking at, at both ends, you know, what is the value choice? How do you create a place of choice? and the narrative behind why people need to come back for purpose-built environments. I see. Linda, is that what you're seeing as well with your management of portfolios for your clients? Yeah, absolutely. I think Tom's comments were spot on. I just add um, another focus that we're starting to see is a lot of focus on employee well-being, um, especially kind of getting through the pandemic. There's a big focus on mental health. And so from a real estate perspective, people are looking for their spaces that are going to attract their people back to the office at some point. We're talking six or, month, or more months out. Um, and so there's a big focus on what is the air quality? How is it measured? Um, what types of spaces here allow people to take a mental break during the day? And so a lot of focus on that. The other thing is a lot of the CEOs are making um, grandstands around um, carbon reduction. And so getting to net 
zero is a big theme. And so a lot of tenants now that are looking at spaces are wondering what is the landlord's, um, per, their view on this? How are they gonna help me? Especially if I'm a tenant in a building and I don't own the building, there's certain systems that I don't control. And so I will need a landlord who's gonna partner with me or who also sees this as a priority for me. And that's also driving the decision of where to go in a much more important way. Well, Mitch, how are mechanical engineers dealing with air quality issues and safety? Well, so there's a couple of different issues. And the first is the immediate needs. How do we make our staffs and our employees feel safe about coming back to work? And that's certainly the IAQ issue. And uh, there's a number of technologies that have been brought to force uh, to help reduce the opportunity for the COVID-19 to spread. Uh, and, and every building is now looking at those technologies and they run the gambit from, from uh, uh, you know, lighting levels that uh, kill with UVC that kill uh, the virus uh, in the air handling equipment, better filtration. And then there are newer technologies that are coming out that actually are antimicrobial and antiviral technologies. But the key is to make the workplace as safe as possible. Uh, that's what's gonna get our staff to come back. The second piece is we also have to have a mechanism for them to get to work. And certainly the tr public transportation, certainly my staff, probably 85% of my staff come in by public transportation. And uh, so we need to have a mechanism by which they can feel safe about coming to work. So changing office hours so that they don't come in on crowded trains and, and uh, approaches like that are very, very important. And then obviously having adequate PPE and, and uh, technology within the office space. And then I think later in this conversation, we've got to talk about once we get them back in the office, what do we do to keep them there? And I think that's going to be a very important conversation. And I agree with Linda. Certainly tenants today are, are getting smarter and buildings are getting smarter about how to attract them. And certainly uh, carbon footprint is a big issue. And uh, I'm prepared to talk about a little bit of that later as well. Well, Tom, the world pre-pandemic was going towards um, a hoteling or benching model. What are you seeing with respect to design now? Where we want to bring our employees back, of course, in the most effective and safe manner possible, but we also have to collaborate. I mean, that's why we go to offices, right? How do we bring in visitors, clients, meetings, and so on? What are we doing really with respect to design and architecture and layouts um, to maintain safety protocols, but also to foster collaboration? Well, um, David, yeah, I think that what has come out of this emerging trend of really people starting to after the first you know, few months of chaos and then everyone sort of going through this mission critical moment of leaving the office, as we start to reflect and come back into it in a very smart cerebral way, um, the office is taking on three themes, uh, learning, performance, and connecting, right? And all of those themes are so interesting is they're really multi-layered. They are probably themes that were emerging before the pandemic. So I like I, I sort of think about it as, you know, what we've what we need to reinvent in a year or two or the 22 back to work would have maybe taken 10 years in the work environment. So these themes around technology, these things around ferocity, these things around mobile workplace uh, lifestyle and work style blending to be more engaging be more um, user-friendly to people, to commuters, to workers, all trends that were in the, in the mode and have just been fast forwarded on us, as I said, one year's worth that would have taken five. Um, I think what we see happening is clients are definitely, you know, looking at a back to business model in two years. So when I'm looking at space and I'm um, working with tenancies, right, on the tenant side, uh, we look at it two ways. We look at it as a burn-in period of how do you want to start to function and grow into your space, and then we look at it from the densities and the square footages that we saw before, but the program has subtly changed. The program more focused on learning and training areas, more, more focused on content areas. Like every office we strategize now or starting to design as they slowly think about this, Zoom rooms, production rooms, um, content areas. I'm designing an office now, as I mentioned before, with the, with the, with the technology and, and multimedia firm. And every part of the office is Zoom capable. So we're working with a set designer to figure out the lighting in every area for Bloomberg interviews, for Zoom interviews, for developing content. So the, uh, the overflow embeddedness of technology is reshaping how we design. 
the way we collaborate is people on site, people off site, casual technology in the cafe, the way we're looking at flexibility. So day one, 300 square feet a person, back to business, 150. So those are some of the things that are influencing the, the ta our tactical responses for rethinking the program and managing the densities and the square footage requirements. And one of the most basic thing that we keep on getting a lot of pressure on in a good way is that every space has to have three functions. Like business leaders aren't quite sure of where everything's going. So when we start to design a kit of parts or a program for a client or even a pre-built for an owner, we are starting to look at how can that manage a client's needs over time? So, you know, rooms becoming studios, becoming conferencing, becoming places for war for teams. Lots to live. of flexibility. Totally. I see. Now, John, you, we, Joe, we saw the prior panel, they're talking about 2022, 2024. What's the demand outlook in the next three years, John? What's Madison Capital um, baking into their um, investment strategies? Well, we hope it's gonna be better. Um, it, it was obviously very slow last year and we've seen some positive signs since the beginning of the year. Uh, we, we've been seeing traction uh, on spaces that um, didn't have much going on last year. So that's obviously, um, that's obviously important and, and positive. Uh, we, we think that this year is gonna be you know, relatively slow, but it's gonna pick up and it's gonna track uh, similarly to, to how the economy and uh, the vaccinations are going, frankly. Um, but just to echo on, on what Tom was talking about in terms of the design, what we're thinking about buildings, um, not just in terms of you know, who's out there and who we can put in, but how are we creating a community there and how are we creating an ecosystem in these buildings to make the office you know, that much more essential to a lot of these companies' business plans? Because a lot of them are still really in, in the process of determining what their needs are. Um, so when they do come back, it has to be something that's exceptional, that's really part of leveraging their business and, and allowing their employees to, uh, to feel like they're a part of their brand um, that, even more so than point. previously. Ha Right. How do you promote a firm culture and a brand um, post pandemic? I would think, Glenda, there's um, different strategies there. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, it's um, to look at the positive aspects first of what this pandemic has done. Um, it has, I think, a lot of our clients are saying, allow people to connect at speed, at pace with one another more frequently and across oceans and borders more easily. And so in some ways you get to know your colleagues a little bit in, in a deeper way, but um, by far and away, the, the work from home experiment has been quite successful, more successful than people would have imagined, but there's a couple of things that aren't working and one of them is culture. It's very difficult to build your culture. And the other one is onboarding new employees and how do you get them properly onboarded, but then also ingrained with your culture when they can't build a network or see people very easily. And so um, you think about how this ties back to real estate and sort of the intersection of real estate people and technology really is how clients are really kind of focusing on this. And so that we're looking to designers to come up with innovative ways. The office really needs to serve more purposes like Tom mentioned, but it's a lot about collaboration. People don't necessarily need to come in just to sit on a Zoom call or attend a virtual conference like we're doing today, but they really, there's they the aspect of what's missing is the mentoring. So the young people in the firm need to sort of get knowledge from the more senior people in the firm. And, and a lot of that happens in person. And so I think um, what we're seeing is there's a lot of uncertainty from the clients they're trying to look out to 2024, but it's very hard for the businesses to know how their business is going to be structured. And so because of the uncertainty, we're seeing clients want us to figure out a way to build in flexibility for them. You know, for example, I mentioned the other day, we have a client now who's building out a space. It was already in motion pre-pandemic. We did pause it. Um, and then we were trying to figure out what should we do? Should we take out half the desks to create social distancing? And what we ended up doing is actually um, we, we removed half of the furniture or we decided not to buy half of the furniture, but we, we ran power and data for all the furniture because to John's point, it might look different two years from now. And so what clients really want is flexibility and sort of innovation that's gonna allow them to make a different decision you know, in two years. Linda, I think that is um, right on point but there's some industries that you just have to be in large crowded rooms all the time. Take a lawyer, for instance. We're in old buildings. Um, you can't have trials remotely. It just doesn't work. Um, temporarily, it's a decent fix, but everything um, in the realm of litigation has been slowed down. What about conventions? Mitch, 
how do we deal with the, you know, let's say 60 Center Street, which is an old, beautiful, you know, 10 story courthouse. But what do we do to get back there? What do we do to start conventions now? And a lot of our convention centers through our country are older buildings. Can they be made safe? Well, the answer is yes. Um, and, and it's certainly one of the things that's in the forefront of everyone's mind is how do we make these buildings safe? Uh, and that's when I start out. And there are technologies now that are being developed and that will be readily deployed uh, through existing infrastructure that will allow buildings to significantly reduce and with some uh, practice uh, eliminate the concept of social distancing. Look, this is not the first pandemic that's ever hit the US and it certainly won't be the last. So we've learned a lot of lessons about what not to do and, and the technology we believe exists to allow us to return back to work uh, even before the vaccine is uh, uh, fully deployed. But more importantly, it positions us for future pandemics, um, which we know will come. And so, as I said, the issue is now creating an environment, indoor air quality, that significantly reduces the viral loading and therefore allows people to return back to something that resembles a more normal uh, life. And, and believe me, normal, what we had last year will not be normal ever again. Uh, I am certainly convinced that uh, we learned a significant amount about what we can do by social separation and by virtual meetings. And that certainly uh, many of our firms have been able to continue to succeed uh, with, with uh, pretty consistent performance, even though we were not physically together. I agree with the other, the other uh, panelists that you must, there's so many things that we do better in person than we could ever do on screen. Uh, uh, certainly panels, <laughs> you can get away with the screen, but mentoring young uh, burgeoning minds is best done side by side, shoulder to shoulder, face to face. Uh, I can tell you that uh, my staff is yearning for it as much as we are to uh, get back to them to do that. Um, but I think that uh, it's just a matter of time before we are able to deploy the right technology, both in existing buildings as well as in new buildings uh, and believe me, new buildings are going to start taking a significant turn, uh, favoring IAQ, favoring carbon reduction, um, uh, and, and being driven by local L97. That will certainly change buildings of the future. That doesn't mean that the buildings of the past will no longer be able to be used. They will have to adapt. And, uh, and we are certainly here to help that. John, what, are, what is Madison doing with respect to repositioning um, or kind of viewing their assets possibly differently. One little thing you told me about in preparation for today's panel was operable windows and how that became something that, you know, is all of a sudden kind of like a crown in your buildings that people want operable windows. There are a number of uh, aspects of the buildings that are quite popular right now. The operable windows being one of them and also the HVAC systems uh, that Mitch and others are, are designing and installing. Um, and that's sort of to get over the initial concern about air quality and uh, existence within the building for a lot of these companies. Um, but there's other amenities that we're seeing um, being very attractive right now. For, exa for example, private entrances. So if there's the optionality for a tenant to have their own entrance, um, that's quite appealing. And it's not necessarily that they don't want to see everybody else in the building eventually, but just to have the option of not seeing anybody else in the building uh, is something that we're, we're getting traction on. Also, um, with regards to old buildings and the, the building stock that's, that's currently in the city, um, we're, we're seeing a preference really towards larger floor plates and buildings that have the ability to uh, spread empl employees out further as part of their design. Um, so some of the taller, um, you know, smaller floor plate buildings uh, may end up being repurposed. We saw that in the financial district over the course of many years, a lot of those old office buildings turning residential. Um, but particularly buildings that have larger floor plates just allow for that much more flexibility for companies to be able to design for the 300 square feet per employee, uh, as Tom was describing, and also to provide for more of these communal areas. Because again, everybody's coming back if they're not planning on being there five days a week, they're planning on being there three days a week. It's the collaboration aspect 
of the design is just becoming that much more important. Um, so being able to spread out and, and having that uh, flexibility with design is, is critical to how these companies are thinking. So Tom, oh, go on, I, go I, on. I, can I add on to that point? I think it's a really important point on what we're doing with the older stock, especially in New York City. So from a tenant perspective, and as we're out here helping our clients figure out where to go, um, what we're seeing for the larger corporations, especially the multinationals or those that have a big workforce and a lot of flexibility about where people sit is um, what they figured out in this pandemic is they're really, it really is time to assess who really needs to sit in an expensive mar market like New York City. Um, can certain people be pushed over to Iowa or to Charlotte to, to places where real estate is less expensive? And so those that stay are client facing for some companies. And so those companies are looking for a very high end or um, a sort of modern space. And so putting looking at these older buildings is really important for the landlords to figure out how they're gonna reposition their buildings, what amenities they're gonna be able to offer to attract people, because really what we're Seeing is tenants are thinking about um, only sitting front, you know, forward-facing, market-facing employees in these expensive markets like New York post-pandemic. That's interesting, especially since you're the senior VP for New York clients. <laughs> <laughs> well, right Tom, before this, I was Wells Fargo, and I ran a much bigger territory, and so I'm always thinking about it a little bit more globally. So, <laughs> but you know, the prior panel was talking a bit about New York City and the special sauce, and I do think that. You know, one ingredient in our sauce is that um, the city attracts young, smart, dynamic people. And if New York City can continue to do that, I don't think we're going anywhere. Um, we just saw a couple of large tech firms take up a lot of space, um, including um, the entire Farley office building, which was almost a million square feet. And I think Google's taking over the Lord and Taylor building. Um, and they did this during the height of the pandemic. So you can see where they're looking at the future, right? They're in total belief that smart young people will still want to come to New York City um, for all of our great um, culture and um, the center of finance and so on. Tom, I saw you shaking your head. Can you talk to us a little bit about more kind of drill down into this purpose built office space? You know, what are the themes that we're seeing? And it does seem to be challenging um, where maybe you know, executives and workers want privacy and safety, um, but businesses don't work without collaboration. Right, I, I think that there are sort of eight emerging trends and they, um, to Linda's point and to John, Jonathan's point, they, they do vary in terms of the size and scale of an organization. So, so the boutique financial firms I'm working with really echo the sentiment that um, David, you were saying, I, I'm quoting directly, winners want to be with winners, ambition fosters ambition. When it's that. So like, you know, when you're hiring the best talent for the best consulting and advisory services model, that connectivity is going to group up people. So we're not going to lose that. Every executive I'm talking to who leads firms like that is drilling down on that, trying to understand the power of coming back. But in the larger scale tendencies that Jonathan and I are working on a project together, where the building within a building capabilities, the large floor plates that have breezeways and crosswalk versus corridors and circulation. The ability, you know, those 80,000 square foot floor plates I'm working on five buildings right now in New York that are really starting to under, understand what that means for large scale enterprise tenants. We're living in an industrial economy where there's more in and out coming in. There's the Amazon effect. So, you know, the industrial scale of a building for a certain size tenant, a tech tenant fortunate enough to work on Farley and a lot of those buildings. So that the nature of those of those buildings is really powerful to the company's business agenda. But we're also looking at um, a telecommunications media and tech economy now. And those demand black box space. So media firms, niche media, you know, the growth of that in New York and the talent base here, as one of my clients said, everyone today now has become their own channel, right? Because we're all zooming ourselves, we're all picking our niche, we're all picking what we want we're choosing, we're curating. So all of those kinds of organizations really lean towards buildings that foster collaboration, which is the first thing we start to understand, create a secure, fresh environment. That's really important, what Mitch was saying, at top of the line, advance the learning curve, because you have to be growing and changing. I think that what we forget is some of the basics, which is security like having a go-to facility so someone's not hearing your private financial information while you're sitting in your den. I mean, we forget the basics of security, confidentiality of information, 
amazing tech services, mission critical infor information. I mean, for a law firm, for an architecture firm, for, you know, there are the basics of the ability, of the ability to accommodate those things that we've stretched a little bit, but we need to really understand the importance and power of the safety of walls behind an office as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, our law firm, 85 attorneys, everyone working remotely for the most part. And, you know, we have to constantly remind our staff and attorneys to save things to our system. Don't work on it on your own system. Um, even though it may be your initial reaction, just save something on my, a Word document on my hard drive. That doesn't work for security. It doesn't work for banks, law firms, or you know anyone who has sensitive security issues. Um, Linda, how, you know what's your experience there, where you know you're dealing with remote workers, but you know we need to bring them in, or um, or they become some sort of combo, right? Remote, part time, in office, collaboration, the other part. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the term that was used by uh, one of my architect partners is the fluid worker. Um, and so kind of figuring out um, what that cadence is going to be for people. Um, and so most, I think a JLL put out a survey recently and it seemed like um, nearly 80% of people said that they wish to return to the office in some capacity. Most people didn't seem to want to come five days a week, but somewhere between two to three or three to four days a week seem to be the sweet spot. And so we do think we'll see this fluidity. One of the challenges our clients are trying to get their minds around is, you know, it seems like what's actually gonna happen is there'll be 100% of the people in the office Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and nearly no one there Monday or Friday. And so how do we create this cadence? Um, and so then technology comes into play. And so um, some of our clients, we're helping them to look at um, reservation systems, booking systems, but systems that allow them to understand when are my partners, people that I work with, to come into the office how can we plan it so it's a little bit more spread out we can understand what the distancing is going to be when we get there um, and it's not as simple as it may seem to kind of orchestrate all of that and so we really are starting to see this sort of technology overlay into this fluid worker so that it's not just a show up and take a desk sort of situation but that it's a little bit more measured i see so getting back to the actual space will lobbies change mitch will um the thought process on um, vertical transportation, elevators change. Um, we heard John say that- Yes, um, yes, and yes. So, so what, uh, what will it look like in you know, a new building being designed today? No, great question. And one of the things that we certainly will see in the very short term is gonna be uh, a major push towards hands-free everything. Where you walk in, you don't touch the door, you don't touch the turnstile, you don't touch the elevator. And that's the good news about the technology that we have available today and that's gonna be coming and becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, so the question before was, you know, where do we see the, work, the workforce? And, and I think there's absolute consensus that it's gonna be a hybrid of some work from home and, and many work from the office. The key for all of us as designers is to make the office a place where they want to go. If you want people to come to work, you gotta make them want to come to work. So the challenge that we have is making the work environment a place that they want to go. It wants to be experiential. It wants to be a, like, uh, you know, and Tom touched on earlier, a little touch of uh, work, play, and, uh, and relax. Uh, so that people know that they can have a place to go to and feel comfortable, but yet collaborate and do all the things they need to do. One of the key factors to that success will be technology. And we all have heard about IoT, the Internet of Things. And every device that we wear, our phones, our watches are becoming smarter and smarter. And the concept ultimately as it evolves is that you will go into a smart workplace. When you go, when you walk in the building, it will know it's you, it'll know it's David's come to work. It knows that David has a coffee and a bagel in the morning and the robot will deliver that to David's office when he comes in, just in time delivery. Um, it knows when David leaves and they'll shut his systems down. When David's- Who do I complain to? If the bagel's the wrong kind. Talk to your phone. Right. <laughs> That's the complaint part. But my point is, it'll be smart technology. The lighting will have circadian rhythm that, that's tuned to you. Your, your diffuser will be smart diffusers. It'll automatically change the temperature to your preference. Um, this is where it's going. And then it's seamless technology uh, will make it much easier for people to work. And quite frankly, be able to commute uh, seamlessly back and forth between the homework office and the, and the office office. So that's where we see it going and, and it will change everything. The whole experience of going to work will be different. 
and it's going to evolve. Um, and uh, I think I'll. I'll add here, I think Mitch makes a really good point. And um, I'll just say it's not as far off in the future as people may think, or as it may sound to some people. I mean, right now we have some projects where, to Mitch's point, the cell phone is used to control things like the height of the sit-stand desk. So you never actually have to touch it. The cell phone is used to sign in when you walk into a meeting room, you never have to touch anything. Um, and these are being rolled out right now. Some of these things were rolled out last year. And so I think it's not as far off into the future. This pandemic has absolutely accelerated a lot of sort of the technology and the integration of it for companies. And I think some of the clients are just still trying to get their minds around the security of all of that, especially firms that have high security uh, protocols, but definitely really excellent point. Right. So the, the, the key word to all this is smart building and smart building technology will be key. Tom, I see you shaking your head. Did you want to add something there? I think that all of the um, mission critical aspects that we talk about, Mitch was talking about in terms of the seamlessness and Linda were talking about, you know, sort of the, the room typologies and the flexibility and then Jonathan sort of the nature of buildings. And I, I think my biggest fear is, you know, in terms of when, when I'm working with executives right now, because nobody really has the answer of, you know, maybe the fall I bring back in, a, in I'll bring back my teams, you know, 300 person firms and up. And, and it's interesting, you know, they're looking at it quarterly, monthly, weekly, and daily, like what their program is. And I think some of the fears that come back are not just the physical things that the four of us all do, providing buildings, design, innovation, management, but what if executives are, am I going to create two classes of citizens, the people that come to the office and the people that don't? How am I going to navigate the governance models in my organization? How am I going to build collegiality? What are the real performance metrics that we're going to achieve from the people on site to the people off site? Where's equity in the firm? You know, um, I think on the prior panel, Bob Alexander was saying, you know, the, the executives are in going to meetings middle level workers or maybe home, you know, like there's this real, there's a lot of really deep questions that leaders of the firms, which we all do, we all lead our own organizations as well, beyond the bricks and mortar that are really challenging organizations and really challenging, not how they think about real estate, but in terms of how they think about it as their business. So that's what I'm really hearing a lot when I meet with executives and they, and they're not sure about what direction to take or there's some really big systemic issues like security that as um, people who deliver bricks and mortar, we're being brought into those conversations because they're asking our advice and they're sharing their concerns. So it's a very interesting time emotionally and intellectually to be working with senior executives who have to make really big decisions because it's scrolling right to the top now. Like there isn't a meeting I have that's not with like the chairman, right? Like it's, it's at the top level and, it's, and, and the conversations are very um, advice, innovative, re-thoughtful. And, and that's one of the things I'm just like learning from all this. It's really, it's very interesting because of the challenging times we're in. I see. I want to shift a little bit to New York City. Um, there was quite a bit of discussion on the prior panel regarding what the city could do to help business. Well, what can the city do to help design, whether it's from transportation to helping us with um, retrofitting buildings, um, what direction can we look to them to take um, to help us, you know, on the other side of the pandemic? Mitch, well, thoughts there? I'll, say I'll drink and start this conversation because I think the city has taken a, a pretty big step already, which was local on 97. And Linda, disc, you know, she talked about it earlier. And people don't really appreciate the, 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 uh, the significance of local on 97, which is the carbon reduction uh, law. But what it's really doing is pushing people to start thinking forward. Uh, buildings that are going to be designed literally now from this point forward will be completely different than those which were designed even two or three years ago. Um, and, and they're doing it for the right reasons, but it's also causing us to, as engineers and as designers to start thinking in, in a much more holistic and, uh, and future forward looking uh, way. So the Carbon Reduction Act says you can't have boilers and, and, and you have to start looking at your energy reduction. What does that mean? It pushes us to do better design. Um, part of that is also in, in the process of saving energy, it forces us to start looking at better ways to, to provide better ventilation, better indoor air quality, better lighting, um, and just basically smarter design across the board. And I think that is going to yield 
uh, significant results to both the tenants and landlords over the long run. It's painful today because a lot of the technology which we need doesn't exist. And uh, um, certainly we're doing three projects right now that are all electric, um, hugely forward facing uh, projects, but the technology is literally evolving as we're designing the job. And it makes life very interesting to be sure. But certainly these are things that are gonna be coming down the pipe for, for all New Yorkers. And I think it sets New York apart from virtually any place else in the world. And, uh, and for that, we should be very grateful that we are literally leading the trends and setting the new standards. John, I see you shaking your head. Yeah. I imagine you're investing, you know, tons of money into your buildings. Um, you know, obviously to not only make them tenant friendly, but to have safe properties that will last a long time. What can the city do to help you? Um, you know, the city says their tax base is going to be down drastically for the next couple of years, especially the real estate tax base, which for New York City, I think it's about 50 percent of their total tax revenue. Um, now, John, you have to go. Madison Capital has to go and make tremendous investments into their building. Um, yeah. yeah, so uh, I have a slightly different perspective. Which I, I think that we're, we're in the environment right now where the, the best thing that the city can do is cheerlead for New York. You know, I think people are forgetting uh, what New York really is because we haven't been experiencing it you know, for a year. So getting out there and promoting the city and setting us up for as fast of a recovery as we can experience as soon as the population is vaccinated. And I think the city took a big step in announcing that they were returning to their office in May. And I think that was an incredibly positive sign. Um, and anyone who is involved in the mayoral race should be on the subway every day, in my opinion. Um, they should be promoting everything that was great and will be great again. And I think another reminder people should have is New York always rebounds because it reinvents itself because of the creative energy that we have. And that is going to be a big part of how we recover because as we're all discussing, you know, the use of all these buildings in, in the city is gonna change and how companies and real estate owners and architects and designers and lawyers and everyone adapts and how we position the city for the next phase post COVID is gonna be a, a really <laughs> intricate part of how quickly we rebound. So the short answer is uh, get out there, promote the city and uh, remind people that we always come back. And the more that you do that, the faster we will. I think Excellent, also, Linda. Yeah, I think the other thing the city can do, I believe that they will do is invest in infrastructure in the city. Um, and so making sure that the uh, the platforms that are needed to move people through the city and into the city um, are, are gonna be in place and stable and that people will feel safe in those uh, areas and environments. And I think um, because the tax base will be down, that there will need to be a renewed focus. I think there already is, it's moving this way in P3, in public private partnerships, because the government won't be able to pay for all of it on their own and they will need private funds. And so partnering with um, the developers, New York has a plethora of very stellar um, a stable of developers here. And so investing in uh, infrastructure and really increasing P3 and private partnerships with um, public funding is gonna be critical to the comeback. And we gotta make sure Chuck down in Washington brings home that pork for us. Um, right. He's the majority leader from New York. Yeah. Um, he's got a major role to play for us um, with respect to that. John, staying on the subject of New York City, over the last 10, maybe even 15 years, we've seen such growth and development in the outer boroughs, particularly Brooklyn and Queens. Are we gonna see, is that, has the pandemic changed any of that growth? Um, it has. So, you know, our, our company owns a, a large asset in Sunset Park, uh, 1.3 million square feet, uh, mixed use industrial, uh, an office and retail. And um, we've seen a, a ton of activity in that submarket. Uh, we're seeing on the office side, there are companies that are looking in areas of Brooklyn because that's where a lot of the workforce is. You know, Brooklyn is the most populous borough in New York. Um, but also on the industrial side, we've been seeing a lot of activity in certain submarkets um, around New York City, just, you know, responding to the, to the uh, e-commerce last mile trends. So we, we think that there's uh, a lot of interesting factors at play in the boroughs. Uh, we also think there's interesting opportunities in Manhattan because um, as was mentioned on the previous panel, 
you know, the, the cost of living in New York has reduced somewhat. And you're starting to see people move around, uh, sometimes going the other way, going from you know, the boroughs into Manhattan. And uh, everyone living in New York understands how dynamic it is. Um, and sometimes people want to be experiencing uh, different boroughs at different times of their lives. So we think that there's interesting opportunities abound um, all around the city. I, I can, um, if I can add there, David, I'd agree. Um, we're seeing some of our tenants go to what people call the hub and spoke model, uh, which is where you still have that sort of main office in the city, but maybe it's not as large as it used to be. And you sort of have these, these spokes around in the different boroughs that are closer to people's homes or where they live so that they can have an opportunity to pop in and maybe even congregate if there's a number of them out there. Um, and we're, st we're seeing a trend for that. And I think that'll be that'll continue, I think, and that'll be an opportunity for, for work in the boroughs too. Right, and Excellent. David, one other sector which, which hasn't been touched on yet, either the previous panel, this is the life science sector in New York, which is exploding. And it, the good news is that it is uh, universally exploding both in Manhattan and in the outer boroughs. And uh, a significant number of projects are being built in both Brooklyn and in Long Island City, Queens, in addition to that which is being done in, in, in Manhattan which is important because it has, it has flourished in the face of the pandemic. Uh, and it has shown that, that New York does have resiliency and, uh, and we see that market only getting bigger and stronger, not again, not only in Manhattan, but also in the outer boroughs. So keep an eye yeah, on Yeah, that's a good, that's a real, real good point, Mitch. Tom, I saw you shaking your head there. Anything to add with respect to um, individual sectors? Um, well, obviously, I think the roll up and what we'll see of telecommunications, media and, and tech, just sort of um, that whole, you know, from niche to aggregate and the movement that might happen in that world. Um, I'm an architect, not a business expert, but I, that's a very compelling world of investment and a very compelling world of talent base. And New York's the center of it. You know, New York has has always been the center of brand and media. So I feel like that's super exciting. I think that uh, boutique finance and uh, scaled finance is, is, is still one of the biggest groups that I work with right now. You know, smaller family run offices, hedge funds, um, as I said, private equity, because there's a lot of movement happening, a lot of things to invest in. So that's been a really robust group that I've been working with recently within the pandemic to think about what's our next chapter and how I bring the best in. But I think overall, Linda mentioned the word fluid. I'm just going to step back. I'm on the board of Center for an Urban Future and kind of step back and look at the economic development of New York from the master planning side. And, um, you know, we sometimes forget, you know, Rockefeller Center, Empire State Building went up in the depression, you know, post 9-11 world financial center got reinvented as a lifestyle destination. 70s, individuals created Soho, the 90s. Like, you know, we just have this amazing, New York has this amazing curation of the individual that comes here to create change and find their career path, which is very unusual for most cities. Like you come here, it's a difficult place. You come here to make yourself something, right? Then you've got this public model of the city beautification movement in the turn of the century, just like a public New York myth. And then you've got amazing private enterprise, right? You've got amazing businesses here that push and work together and think differently. And then you've got all of us helping collect all those things to create amazing environments for it all to land. And I think that makes us an incredibly different city than any other. And if you really map the velocity change we go through for the size and scale and density and thickness we are, uh, on one little island, <laughs> it's kind of amazing. <laughs> so uh, it, it really I'm, an is. I'm an optimist. <laughs> right. Should run for mayor. One, um, one, one other <laughs> sector that's um, been interesting that we've seen take off. On the last panel, Don Peoples was there, and he mentioned how New York is becoming more. It's going to become more affordable. And actually, we're seeing this. There's a trend with studios, believe it or not, that are happening. There was always film industry in New York. We all know that. But the number of um, our clients that are from the West Coast, where we did a lot of work for them in LA, um, that are moving to their studio some of their filming and um, broadcasting here has really picked up so we actually are developing a studio practice to support that business so that's one sort of interesting that's great. Is, yeah some of that is in the borough some is a little bit in new jersey but these you know generally it's coming to new york and uh, right. let me give you my uh email and phone number you can have those clients potential clients. <laughs> you can space for them absolutely that's great <laughs> So we have less than 10 minutes left. I was told to open it up to questions. So as the questions come in, I'll direct them to our great panelists here. But 
while we're waiting, why don't we touch a little bit upon transportation? Tom, we are such a small island, you know, Manhattan, 26 miles, um, and then you add the boroughs into it. There's no other city in the United States that relies on transportation like New York City. Are we going to see changes here in the long term? Um, you know, come next January, are the subways going to look the same? Are they going to feel the same? And what about three, four, five years from now? Uh, well, you know, that is such a complex issue, and I'll be honest, it's, it's, it's way above my pay grade, <laughs> the public transportation system. But, uh, you know, I know there's talks of scheduling and programming the subways, and I think that from the, um, from the building side, I think that uh, I'm working on a number of buildings that sit within sort of the Grand Central, Bryant Park, Times Square district. So neighborhood, in between neighborhoods that have one-stop commutes, so if you're coming in from Penn Station, you can walk somewhere, right? You're coming in, or, you know, I'm working with Jonathan, drivable places, you know, places that have lots of capability for bringing things, you know, driving there or bringing people there by, you know, various forms of vehicular transportation, working on a number of properties on the west side that have alternative vehicular commuting, like the biking model. Or the, so when yes, you start cycles about, and skateboards. When you start to think about, like, walking to work further, everyone taking more of a walk to work, everyone biking to work, scooters, possibly alternate forms. You know, what, how does that affect buildings? You know, do you have mud rooms? Do you have places that are, I like to say sportswear meets workwear. Like we're all becoming more casual. We might jog to work. We might be going to work on off hours. So how does that start to affect uh, the hosting and hospitality aspect of commercial office buildings? Honestly, the, the public transportation, I think going Mitch was saying, going back to the filtration systems, going back to the vac vaccine, that'll probably, my best guess, you know, will just eventually burn in to a comfort level. But um, I can only speak to the way we're looking at different forms of commutability and how office buildings can host that. In maybe it's not always a front door model. If I'm coming in with my yoga mat and my bike, you know, do I really want to come into front door offices or should we make the industrial side of the buildings more host oriented? Should there be drop off areas? Should be, there be cubbies and storage areas, clean off areas before you go upstairs? I always look at it from that perspective, um, but I'm sure my colleagues have their point of view, Mitch, around the subway and the, and the quality of that in terms of purification and safety. Well, uh, so I'll, I'll let a small cat out of the bag because there, there, I talked about it earlier. There are technologies out there uh, that are actually being tested right now on subways that will provide a significant improvement over the um, safety on, from an air quality perspective. Um, it has been tested. It's EPA approved. And, and, and that's as far as I can go with it right now because it's not been approved by New York. But there is considerable planning on on public transportation to improve that because there's no question that in the future that will become, it, not that it already isn't, but it will continue to be the prominent method by which people get to work. I think the other thing which we've all touched on a bit and in varied degrees is the live, work, play neighborhood, creating villages. It's no longer just a business center and an office building. You know, people are looking for an experience. They, you know, that's why the, you know, the, the city building in, 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 uh, in uh, Tribeca has been hugely successful. I mean, that was a concern in the past to be a kind of an odd decision to put a building there. Now it's like genius because it is a live, work, play uh, perspective. It is a small village. And certainly we see that happening, you know, these clusters, live, work, play clusters uh, growing uh, across New York. And there's no question in my mind that's going to become a trend. But uh, certainly public transportation, the government is, would love to spend more money on it. The problem is they don't have it. They can't spend what they don't got. And uh, hopefully the stimulus package will help uh, reseed that investment because clearly that is an infrastructure that is in desperate need of upgrade, but will absolutely be key to the success of the city going forward. Absolutely. One, we have about three more minutes. One last topic. Um, we've been getting a lot of calls over the last month about vaccine confirmation um, and everything from employers, private employers demanding it, possibly demanding it, to Live Nation is seriously considering that you come to your events with a phone and an app that shows that you had your vaccine if you want to come to the hockey game or something like that. And then, you know, schools, you know, they require confirmations of, you know, the MMR vaccines across the country. So this is something 
that it is possible they're going to start requiring um, COVID vaccine confirmations. Have you been um, hearing these issues from your clients, Linda, Tom? We have, um, you know, some of the other countries in the world are a, a, a little ahead of us in this, or maybe taking a different approach. The U.S. is much more litigious society than um, some other cultures. And so, um, you know, I was talking to a colleague in Sweden the other day, and it was very similar. You have to have this pass on your phone before you can get into the grocery store that scans that says that you've had your vaccination or that you've quarantined um, or whatever. And I do think um, it's definitely an issue that companies and clients are grappling with, even in our own firm. How are you going to be able to require it? Are you going to be sued? Is there going to be some legal ramifications? Um, and it definitely seems like there is a mixed bag. So I think what I'm seeing is that um, real estate has a role in this, but it's very much a collaborative discussion with, between risk and legal and HR um, kind of coming together around this topic and trying to understand what will we be able to do to help people feel safe when they come back together and congregate? Um, and where will the limits around that be where we're sort of infringing upon someone's rights and privacy? So definitely top of mind. Yes, I agree with Linda. <laughs> okay. So with that, that I wanna... <laughs> yes, I am. We'll let you know what to do, Mitch. Although it doesn't look like you're in the office today. No, oh, I've only been in the office six times in the last nine months. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay. So with that, Linda, Mitch, John, and Tom, thank you very much. It's been great getting to know some of you again. Um, you did an amazing um, job today. And Anshin, I want to thank you again for um, having me as your moderator. Thank you all. Um, thank you. And we look forward to watching the next panel. Thank you. Thank you all.